Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Ye have heaped treasure together for the last days. Behold, the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, crieth. And the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. Ye have lived in pleasure on the earth and been wanton. Ye have nourished your hearts as in a day of slaughter. Ye have condemned and killed the just, and he doth not resist you. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he received the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Take, my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. But above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath. But let your yea be yea, and your nay nay, lest ye fall into condemnation. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing songs. Is any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another, that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death, and shall hide a multitude of sin. Greetings YouTube, greetings everyone out there. Today we are going to embark on a journey on the Brett Norman Broadcast Network on this Wednesday, February 13th, 2019. And we are going to do a session with Jörg Lisman in Belgium and also Daryl Eberhardt in Pennsylvania of another reading of the Divine Program of the World's History, a book by Albert Close, which I happen to find by doing a search for Henry Grattan Guinness with the same title. So, in effect, this is a continuation of that same Protestant spirit that was started by Henry Grattan Guinness by Albert Close in around 1917, 18, somewhere in there, maybe a little later than that even. I'm not sure, but I want to welcome both of you to the mic, both Daryl and Yerk. And should we start with Daryl first this time? Yes, Daryl? Uh, I was waiting to see what Yerk said, but uh, yeah, um, it's always, as always, it's a privilege and an honor to be on with uh, two of my Christian brothers and uh, covering a very good uh, book. Um, I also have a book, if I can get it up, called Jesuit Plots from Elizabethan Times to modern times by albert close so 
yeah, Albert Close uh, has written some good material, that's for sure. And uh, again, uh, we're trying to get truth out to folks. We're trying to uh, make sure that we uh, point folks uh, to the Bible, the Holy Bible, because uh, there's nothing more important than reading the right Bible, but it's reading the Bible. And, and for English-speaking people, as we often mention, it's the old King James Bible. Uh, and I would urge everyone, and including myself, to get our noses in our, our old King James Bible for English-speaking people and read God's Word. And the Bible... Uh, the Old King James is based on the correct manuscripts, whether you're talking Old Testament or New Testament, and it's also translated as a verbatim word-for-word formal equivalence. So they're using the right translation technique, and they're using the correct Hebrew Masoretic, and they're using the correct um, uh, received text or Textus Receptus, the Greek manuscripts for their New Testament translation. So you can't go wrong with the Old old King James Bible don't if you're getting a new King James it's not based on the correct manuscripts and there's some changes in the translation too so stick with the old King James so again we're on to uh, uh, make sure that folks know that uh, we're exhorting people to read the Bible we're also exhorting people to pray the Bible has a lot to say about prayer and we need to be praying for um, those Christians are, that are exposing evil, such as Brett and Yerk are doing, and we need to be praying uh, for persecuted Christians around the world because Christians are being murdered, tortured, brutalized uh, all in many, many places in the world. And uh, I think it's coming soon uh, to a neighborhood near us all, possibly uh, with a, a, an inquisition on steroids or as uh, Tom Fress says on his broadcast, his YouTubers, uh, Inquisition update. Uh, the Inquisition has a died, it still exists, and we need to be aware of that. We need to be aware again of all the reformers taking the position that they did, the historicist position that is spoken of by Albert Close here, as opposed to the preterist, the Jesuit sponsored, I should say. Uh, Jesuit orchestrated, Jesuit invented, uh, preterist and futurist uh, positions. So good to be on with you guys, and good to be covering Albert Close. Wonderful, thank you, Daryl and Yerk. Please. Yeah, thank you for inviting me today to come to another reading, the fifth in this regard of Albert Close's book, The Divine History of the Worlds uh, of. The Divine Program of the World's History, that's the title. I'm very much looking forward to it. I just want to tell our listeners once again, because this is a so, uh, so many as video they are watching in these series, because I call it a series because it started off with uh, reading the book that you miraculously found in your um, library there in uh, Minnesota, where you are living, about uh, the book from um, James Edgar Wiley, The Great Exodus, or how uh, the, the times of the end, or how near are we to it. We started reading that, and we went from there into a deeper study of the book of Acts to find out at a certain moment in the reading of the book of, the, uh, of uh, James Edgar Wiley, um, to find out when was the exact moment that the stoning of Stephen took place. Was it really uh, the the end of the 70th week of Daniel took place? Was it really after the stoning of Stephen, or was there another time indicator? And we made that sure through our study. We are still continuing that study in the book of Acts because of our brother Michael, who is very much um, in need of that kind of Bible study. But then we went on reading in the Great Exodus until we came to another point that we said, now we have to look a little bit deeper into this, and that's brought us to the book, The Divine Program of the World's History, the, what we are reading right now. And this is already here, the fifth reading today. I'm uh, very much looking forward to it. And I can tell you I haven't even planned it, and my brothers have not planned it either. So it is a uh, spontaneous coming together in the spirit that we are doing this. And I can tell you, if we are not led by the Spirit, it has no sense to come together anyway and do things like these. We are not doing this for our own fame. We are doing that only for the, uh, 
for the glory of Jesus Christ, you know. I don't want to say for the greater glory of God, because that's a Jesuitical model. Yeah. But uh, it's a shame that they stole an expression like that, because it is all for his glory, you know. Um, uh, it's... it's um, I... Uh, Oh, there's, yeah, there's a saying in the Bible, I just can't get to it right now. Um, oh, I'd love to make a comment, because oh, yeah, I was please. thinking along the same lines, brother, because, um, you know, this, uh, we were talking right before the broadcast here, Yerk, and you were mentioning that uh, that uh, Christendom is uh, something that, uh, <sighs> I mean, you can either view it one of two ways, right? I mean, you, you either you view it as the true body of Christ, or you view it as the false body of Christ. And sadly, sadly, very sadly, I must say that every time I hear that word Christendom, I always think of the false body of Christ. Every single time. Yeah. And how about the truth? What happened to the truth? Daryl, you had made a comment some days ago about the truth has been sacrificed on the, the altar of political and religious correctness. Correct. <laughs> Correct in your statement, yes. <laughs> Indeed, truth and, has been yeah, yeah I sacrificed mean, no matter how on much the you altar. want to mix it up. And, I mean, we're living in a blender, aren't we? Mm-hmm. And it's on steroids now because they created a global, yeah. quote-unquote, environment. And... Goodbye to all what we have, you know, what our, our quote-unquote fathers gave us, which is really our heritage. It's gone. We're devastated, and we don't even realize it. Our head's been cut off, and we don't even realize it spiritually until now. Now we realize it. So, Yerk, we're right with you. Okay, so let's, without any further ado, go to the reading, because otherwise we're having another two-hour session and don't, don't do, exact. A, don't do you, 20 minutes of reading. I really want yeah, to go into Yeah, we're right in this, uh, this study, this very deep study of the book of Daniel, and we're just coming in cold turkey now, so... Yeah, but anyway, it's a, it's a continuance of what we have read before. This is uh, an analysis of Daniel chapter 2 that the author gives us here. And that is um, very interesting because last time we uh, ended with the discussion of this uh, little paragraph that is put here in red. This verse is supposed to prefigure the rise of democratic governments, i.e. the ruling of the people by the common people as contrasted with the despotic and aristocratic uh, government of Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece and Rome. With that discussion last time we ended the reading and now we're going to continue and read... The mighty change from despotic and aristocratic government to the democratic government of today have practically taken place within the last 100 years. Working men today sit side by side in our great parliaments with kings, nobles and other great ministers of state. Truly kings are mingling with the seed of man in a manner they have never did during the times of Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece or Rome. Again, the barbarian tribes, the Goths, Vandals and other savage tribes which overran and overthrew the Roman Empire afterwards mingled themselves with the imperial Roman race and settled in the territories they conquered. In these we may have the miry clay element mingling with the cultured and aristocratic Roman race. Now we continue in Daniel chapter 2, verse 44. You know, it is always a little bit reading of the Bible and then it goes into an explanation of what that means. So verse 44 reads, And in the days of these kings, meaning the ten kingdoms of Western Europe that we are in today, that time, shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed and the kingdom shall not be left for other people but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. The still future kingdom of Christ, the author says, is to be set up in the latter days of the ten kingdoms of Europe, and nobody denies that we are today in the latter days of these ten kingdoms of Europe. It is a tremendous reality yet to come, 
and it may come to pass in our own days. The author says, probably a little bit disappointed that it didn't come in his own days, and I don't even know if it comes in my own days. The conviction deepens in thoughtful minds that the days in which we live have about them the character of finality, and that a great change is impending. Yeah, that remain, reminds me, of course, of Mr. Obama, who always called for a big change in his country in 2008 when he went for the presidency yeah, in what the United a joke. States of America. But the point that Albert Close makes here, you know, he wrote this book now about 100, 100 years ago. We are down today in 2019, and uh, this was published between 2014 and 2017 somewhere, so about 100 years ago. He says that we um, that uh, the conviction deepens in thoughtful minds that the days in which we live have about them the character of finality and that a great change is impending. This change, in my understanding, has already been made. It is a change, first and for all, if I can say it like that, in the minds of the people. The change is to the I am system. And with that, I mean that the people are so selfish today that the world has changed into a selfish brat, if you can call it that. Yeah, A brat, that's a little yeah. guy who is uh, too spoiled, you know? Yeah, like a little George W. Bush waving a stick around. Yeah, that, that's, that's a little bit like it. And the whole world yeah. has become like that. It is just, gimme, 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 and me, 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 me. I on the top and everybody else on the left. And that, that is a change in the mind of people that has taken place. And the dangerous thing about this change, in my humble opinion, is that this is just the precursor of the promise of the serpent in the garden. When the serpent promised to Eve, you will be as gods. We all elevate ourselves as little gods today. That is the mindset of the Western civilization, if you ask me today. That is a quite a change that we could have observed during the last hundred days. Speaking of, of course, when Albert Close wrote this about a hundred years ago. Looking today, in 2019, back at least the last 40, 50 years, I think that is a change. We can all admit that happened, right? How about you, right. Daryl? You have more life experience in this regard. How do you see that? How do I see what? Um, the point that I just made is that an, a change that has been made in our civilization, in our uh, consciousness, and I don't speak of Bible-believing Christians, of course, who, who are just a very, very, very small minority, but the overall sentiment of the societies that we are living in, that it is only about me, 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 yeah. myself, I, myself, I want this, I have to have this, and if I don't get it by myself, then the state has to get it for me. So I'm lured mm. into communism, I'm lured into a state-supported system, mm -hmm. and I, uh, I elevate myself, not I myself now, but you know, speaking for the society, I elevate myself above everything else because I don't need a God, I don't need a Savior, it's me. Isn't that something that you can support that, with your little bit more life experience that you have than I, that you can confirm what yeah, I say? Yeah, don't rub in how much older. <laughs> no, 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 I am agreeing 100%. <laughs> now, I'm agreeing 100% with you, and I was flipping through Matthew looking for the place where the Lord was telling them what it was going to be in, in the last days. And he, he says the, the oh, love of yeah. many will wax worse and worse cold, than for yeah. love for others and that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I was just flipping through whenever you asked that question uh, through Matthew. And we're the Lord warned us that not only would deception be rampant, which it is in our day, but also that brutality that we see, uh, the love for other people in that, for in general, generally speaking, has fallen way to the wayside, and we don't have a lot of people that would, or we do have a lot of people today that would, in the, the story that the Lord told, 
about the, the priest and the Levi that walked by the wounded man and left him. There's a lot of people living today that would do the exact same thing. They would not stop and try to help somebody that was injured or hurt. And many people just close their eyes to what's going on around them when that, that type of violence takes place and they don't intervene. So, yeah, you're, you're 100% correct in your assessment. Well, I appreciate it very much, Daryl, that you can confirm what I just said, that that's my humble opinion, as I stated, that you can, con, con, can, blah, sorry, that you can confirm that uh, actually with a Bible verse, where Jesus Christ spoke about that in the last days the love of people will wax cold one to another. Right. Because that's exactly the point that I was making. I didn't come to that Bible verse, but that's the wonderful thing when we are gathered here together, we three, and do the study. And we always say you have to put the Bible at the first place. That's just what you did with this wonderful citation, Daryl. Thank you very much for that. And that reminds the people also that we are working in the spirit when we are doing these readings and explanations. We are not just pulling things out of our ass. Yeah? That's right. Right. So I'm going to continue reading then on the, this page where it says, What terrible convulsion and what are the means to be employed in fulfilling verse 35 and also the last two uh, clauses of verse 44, quote, shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, unquote. What does it mean if Christ, the rock of ages, the stone cut without hands, is to fall on the ten kingdoms of Western Europe? meaning the iron papal lands, and on the brass, silver and gold, or the Mohammedan lands. This is a most remarkable fact. Get a map and look at it and ponder over the fact that the iron territory is papal and the other metals are almost wholly Mohammedan and, and Greek church. It seems as if the premillennial judgments are to fall chiefly on the two great apostasies in these particular lands. These are the Gentile powers which have had to do with Israel for centuries. Verse 45 in Daniel chapter 2, we continue. The, author in the book says, For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the uh, of mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. And the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof sure. Then the king Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face, and worshipped Daniel, and commanded that they should offer an oblation and sweet odors unto him. The king answered to Daniel and said, Of a truth, it is that your God is a God of gods, and a Lord of kings, and a revealer of secrets, seeing thou couldst reveal the secret. Then the king made Daniel a great man, and gave him many great gifts, and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon, and chief of the governors over all the wise men of Babylon. Now, after Daniel had sought the meaning of the king's vision from the God of heaven, he interpreted it to Nebuchadnezzar as follows. So we are now into the, uh, first we stated what that dream was, and now we are going into the explanation what that dream actually meant in detail. In these verses that we are speaking about now, yeah? that's why we go back to uh, this stuff here. So, after Daniel had sought out the meaning of the king's vision from the God of heaven, he interpreted it to Nebuchadnezzar as follows. First, thou art this head of gold, meaning the Babylonian Empire, which reigned between 747 and 538 BC, which is for 209 years. This gives us the starting point in ancient history. So, it is important that we understand 747 through 538 BC. Second, after thee shall arise another kingdom, meaning the Medo-Persian Empire that reigned between 538 and 334 BC for 204 consecutive years. The Medo-Persians captured Babylon at BC 538 when King Belshazzar was slain. And we read about that still in the book of Daniel, you know, 
the handwriting on the wall, Mene Tekel Ufarsim. You have been weighed and found too too heavy or too light or what was it there? What that mm -hmm. means? Yeah? Mm -hmm. That's just before the Medo Persians come in. The last days of Daniel, because Daniel was even taken out of Babylon and uh, served the first king of the Medes and the Persians, who ended this empire in 538 AD. Point three then, and a third kingdom of brass, the Grecian Empire from BC 334 through 63, 271 years. Alexander the Great overthrew the Medo-Persian Empire in BC 334. Four. And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, the Roman Empire from 63 BC through 476 AD. 539 years. That kingdom, the Roman, shall be divided. It was to be divided into ten kingdoms after its fall in 476 to the coming of Christ, or nearly so. In Revelation chapter 16 there is a hint that just before Christ comes again it may revert into three, but this is only a surmise. I think that the author refers here to uh, this verse in Revelation 16, verse 19, where it says, quote, And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Unquote. Now point six. In the days of these kings, i.e. the ten kingdoms of Western Europe of today, the God of heaven shall set up a kingdom, i.e. that Christ's second coming to reign in righteousness over the earth, which we can read in Matthew chapter 25. It shall never be destroyed, i.e. like the previous earthly empires have been destroyed, this kingdom God will set up will never be destroyed. And it shall consume all these kingdoms, the Babylonian, Medo-Persian, Grecian and the Roman. Christ, when he comes again, is to put down all enemies and rule from pole to pole and from shore to shore. It shall stand forever. The dream is certain and the interpretation thereof is sure. In a footnote, the author tells us, Nebuchadnezzar's and Daniel's visions were divine revelations and were afterwards fulfilled in history. Our dreams are not revelations and of course do not find any fulfillment. This is the age of the Holy Spirit. We have had Christ in the world since Daniel's days and he has revealed the whole future history of the world. No need for visions and dreams now. Now, Seventh-day Adventists, close your ears because you don't want to hear me say that. No need for vision and dreams now. No need for prophets like Alan G. White either. Right on. Spot on. That's right. The four great empires of iniquity, antiquity. A succession of four familiar... Four, Sorry, a succession of four similar universal earthly empires was here foretold to Nebuchadnezzar, and that they are to be followed by a fifth, the empire of stone. The first four would be established and ruled by selfish, sinful men, the last by the God of heaven. The first four would be destroyed, the last would destroy all of them. The first four would be smitten and broken in pieces. The last, the kingdom of the Rock of Ages, would never be destroyed. The first four would form one great image. The last would become a great mountain and fill the whole earth. The first four would be consumed and carried away. The last, the kingdom of the Rock of Ages, would stand forever. By the universal consent of the great scholars and divines of the Church of all ages and of all sections, the first four are allowed to be the Babylonian, the Medo-Persian, the Grecian and the Roman empires. And the last, the still future kingdom of the Son of Man when Jesus Christ and his saints shall reign in righteousness over the whole earth. 
This vision doubtless presents us with a brief historic outline of the four great empires of ancient history, which have in succession ruled the, ten, the then known world. It presents the last of the four, the Roman, in two successive stages. First, as legs of pure iron, secondly, as feet and as toes composed of a mixture of iron and clay, representing under these emblems first, the Roman Empire in its undivided imperial strength, and secondly, the same empire in its tenfold divided condition. Where we can read in Mark chapter 2, verse 24, quote, And if a kingdom be divided against itself, that kingdom can not stand. A common futurist objection is that the historical interpretation finds all the ten kings in the western division of the old Roman Empire and none in the eastern, as if ten toes were on one foot. This objection is based on a pure assumption and betrays besides a superficial study of the prophecies in question. It is assumed that the two legs of the image represent the eastern and western divisions of the Roman Empire. This can be very distinctly disproved. It is true that the fourth empire is represented by the two legs and feet of the image. But it is the entire course of the empire that it is so represented, not the brief stage of twofold division which occupied only one century of the twenty of Rome's history. The Grecian Empire which was never twofold, is similarly represented by the two high th thighs of brass. And we read here in the footnote, had the division of the Roman Empire into eastern and western taken place in the parts of the image represented by the two thighs, this argument would be reasonable. But it is not so. The thighs branch off in the days of Greece in 334 BC. Again, the ten toes grow out of iron and clay portion of the image, not the brass, the silver or gold portions. This is very important. The Eastern Empire of Rome belongs to the gold, silver and brass territory. The Western belongs to the iron. Now, we go to the maps on the following two pages, 18 and 19, and we will analyze these a little bit because my brothers have the same map before their eyes and they can uh, study with us these maps on page 18 and 19 that's coming up and another one on page um, 49 that we can go to later on. But it is about these two maps. So we see here on the left hand side we see the man figure. Babylon with the head of gold, the shoulders and the breast of silver presenting Medo-Persian. The thighs and uh, and the uh, the thighs and uh, what's it? Uh, the tummy. Um. <laughs> oh, breast. Mid section. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> and then you have the Roman Empire, the two iron legs and the feet mixed iron with clay. And we have the times that we spoke about here next to it, so that you can see that easily. And then we have a little description here that is out of the book of Daniel, right next to it. So, um, it is probably a little bit difficult to read that uh, text next to here. But then we have another map on the, on the right-hand side, where we can see um, the world as we know it. Uh, we see the... Uh, Babylonian, we see the Persian, we see the Grecian, and we see the Roman empires right here. So these maps can help us in understanding what we have just um, been told. Now I have to see if when I turn this around, um, just a second, that I can read this little text that is uh, put here in between. It says here the date of the book of Daniel, uh, going over the date of the book. A strong argument that the book of Daniel was written about BC 600 to 550 may be drawn from the two languages in which the book is written, Hebrew and Chaldee. Both were familiar to the Jews and to the Jews only. Hebrew was Daniel's mother tongue and Chaldee the tongue in which he had been educated by Nebuchadnezzar's command. It was the language of Babylon. 
Hebrew ceased to be used by the Jews in and, uh, in and from the captivity, except as a sacred, learned language. Remind you, the Babylonian Talmud, yeah, that is probably written in that language, and that is about the Jews who say they are Jews and are not. But that is a quite another study to go into. It had been entirely superseded before the days of Antiochus by the Greek, and no writer of that time, speaking of BC 164, could have counted on being understood had he written in Hebrew. Daniel in his day, however, could count on both languages being understood. Daniel wrote the first part of the book, in which Nebuchadnezzar personally was so much concerned in Chaldee, and the latter part in Hebrew, as it concerns chiefly the history of the Jews and their fortunes. There may also have been other reasons known only to Daniel. In any case, it was a matter of indifference to him and his readers which language he used. So here we have a little bit better the map now in picture. And we see what we have figured here as a figure of man. We see it here put into uh, the distinctive lands. Yeah? We have here the silver, the, the Persian that is over here. We have here the Babylonian gold. We have that here. And then here we have the Grecian brass that you can see here. And here is the iron, the iron of Rome that is all over here. Everything here is Roman, and uh, in Germany it's it's very important. <laughs> the the border is the Rhine, <laughs> and I live I, I live and I was born in that part that was eastern of the Rhine. That was not Roman territory. <laughs> wow, that's really <laughs> interesting. Yeah, yeah, it is because from very there, close though. <laughs> yeah, from from there comes the Myri clay, yeah, the barbarians. Yeah, um, yep. Who the Goth who overthrow Rome. And because that were mostly Germans, in my little understanding, as I have of that history for the moment, that needs to be further studied by myself and by, by others maybe too, um, that is also the reason why the Germans are so hated by the Roman Catholic Church on the one hand, and on the other hand so venerated. Because, you know, during the time of the Holy Roman Empire, uh, the time of the 1260-year reign of the Antichrist, uh, the emperors were always Germans. And these Germans were descendants of the Goths, who overran the Roman Empire in 476 DC and, and, and threw it off, threw it off the throne. So, but on the other hand, um, yeah, Germany is also very... Catholic, Roman Catholic, uh, at least in the South. So that's quite another in interesting story to, to go in and, and, and study for another time. But do any of you, Brett or Daryl, have any remarks to make about this map that I'm showing here in the video right now? Because you have it open before your eyes. Maybe you want to do some explanation or some give us some insights uh, how you see whether the statue of the man of Daniel here or the or the map that we have here in the picture right now, then I please leave it up to you guys. No, I think both maps are very good representations and, and you've described described them quite well, Yerk. I agree. Okay, then we go back to the book text. I just have to turn that around now again. Nice. So that we can read this. Let's see where we took off. Um, I was reading the footnote, right? That is on the top of the page here. So we ended with the first paragraph. So, what do the two thighs in the history of the Grecian Empire symbolize? Futurists are silent on those points. Okay, but we are studying historicism. What does the author have to say? The nature of the symbol, he says, a human figure required that the legs should be two. The division of the Roman Empire into Eastern and Western is not prefigured at all in either of Daniel's prophecies. It was merely one of several similar partitions which arose in the era of Rome's decline and fall. As you can read in Gibbon's work, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, chapter 28 and um, uh, no, ch uh, chapter 18 and 25. And its main effect was to sever the territory peculiar to Rome 
from the Greek provinces of the east as if to define the sphere in which the ten horns were to rise. Note carefully that when Rome conquered the territories of Greece, Medo-Persia and Babylon, they did not become iron. They still remain brass, silver and gold to the end, as the stone breaks iron, clay, brass, silver and gold to pieces together. A very, very important point, something that I even overlooked many times while reading that. When the stone that is not cut out with hands hits the metal figure in the feet that are made of iron mixed with clay, it destroys the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, the gold, and it all is like from the wind of the threshold blown away. Mm -hmm. That's what it says. So Rome does not take, uh, does not consume, let me say it like this. The iron of Rome does not consume the brass, the silver and the gold. It leaves it where it is. And that's also something that we saw, of course, in this little map that we were just studying. Oh, that, is, that is here. And you see that again. Because all these parts still exist. The Roman Empire was here. It didn't expand into Babylon. It didn't expand into the Persians, right? So it left the silver for what it was. It left the, 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 the brass for what it was. It left the gold for what it was. It was just the iron that Rome dealt with and still deals with. So they still remain brass, silver, gold until the end. As the stone breaks, the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver and the gold to pieces together. To take in the Eastern Empire of Rome as the futurists do, they have to give five of the toes out of the brass, silver and gold territory. The prophecy says that the toes are iron and clay. Mm. Any remarks from you on this, what I've just read? Ah, uh, yeah, let's read that again, please. Yeah, this last paragraph, this is it's very kind important. of tough. It's an important point. Yeah, very important point. Note carefully that when Rome conquered the territories of Greece, Medo-Persia and Babylon, they did not become iron. They still remain brass, silver and gold to the end. As the stone breaks the iron, clay, brass, silver and gold to pieces together. Because if they... If Rome had consumed with its iron the, um, the uh, brass, the silver and the gold, the stone could only destroy the iron in the end. But the Bible says clearly that the stone destroys them all. That means that Rome has maybe usurped these empires, but not eradicated them. That's why we also say that Rome has its roots in Babylon, right? Right. Iron has its roots in the gold. Yep. And that's what the author tells us here. The gold is not gone. The silver is not gone. The brass is not gone. It is still there. It is ruled by iron now, but it is still distinctively there. And that's why when Christ comes and the stone not cut out with hands from the mountain, hits the figure in the feet of iron and clay, it breaks into pieces, in, in, into dust, the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver and the gold. To take in the Eastern Empire of Rome, as the futurists do, they have to get five of the toes out of the brass, silver and gold territory. But the prophecy says clearly the toes are iron and clay. Now, Jesus Christ setting up his kingdom on the ruins of our present-day earthly empires during the last or divided stage of the last empire, i.e. the Roman, occurs a supernatural and tremendous world revolution. All the previous changes when an empire fell had followed each other on the ordinary and natural course, and the kingdoms were in some sense a continuation of each other, for for the great image is one. 
But this fifth and last kingdom, yeah, that stone not cut out with hands, that is no part of the image, that owns a supernatural origin, smites the image on the feet, i.e. at the end of its history, grinds it to powder, takes its place, blots it out of existence, and fills the whole earth. This fall of the stone cut out without hands must symbolize something immensely more important and fundamental than any political change the world has ever seen in all of its history. Tremendous critical revolutions such as the overthrow of Babylon by Cyrus and of Medo-Persia by Alexander the Great have in this prophecy been portrayed simply by the quiet change from one metal to another in the parts of an unbroken image. What then is the great event symbolized by the falling of the stone on the feet of the image which puts an end to the Gentile powers in the image, symbol, uh, uh, the image symbolizes and precedes the establishment on earth of the kingdom of the God of heaven? It doubtless symbolizes the second coming of Christ to set up his kingdom in power upon this earth. It must symbolize that. It is not as some assert, the first advent of Christ 1900 years ago, or 2000 years ago today, to establish Christianity. Because there are people who explain Daniel chapter 2 like this. Impossible! For the stone falls on the feet of the image. The first advent took place in the time of the undivided imperial iron strength of the Roman Empire during the period symbolized by the legs of iron, not after its decay and division into many kingdoms or during the period symbolized by the feet. Christianity had already been established for centuries as the religion of the Roman Empire before the state of things symbolized by the ten toes of iron and clay arose. The Ten Kingdom division of the Roman Empire did not take place till more than 500 years after Christ ascended. Now, we have to read, I think, this little, this last paragraph in the understanding that he explains to us preterism. It is not, as some assert, preterists. The first advent of Christ, that stone not cut out with hands, smashing the figure of man in the feet of iron with clay, that could not have been the first advent of Christ, that is impossible because the stone falls on the feet of the image and that is the end of the time. The first advent took place in the time of the undivided imperial iron strength of the Roman Empire, during the period symbolized by the legs of iron, not after its decay and division into many kingdoms, or during the period symbolized by the feet which we are living in today. Christianity had already been established for centuries as the religion of the Roman Empire before the state of things symbolized by the ten toes of iron and clay arose. The ten kingdom division of the Roman Empire did not take place till more than 500 years after Christ ascended. Besides, the destruction of the image is attributed to the fall of the stone, not to its gradual expansion into a great mountain which fills the whole earth. Now, Christianity did not destroy all earthly monarchy at the time of its advent or in its early ages. On the contrary, its founder suffered under Pontius Pilate. The Roman governor and his apostles were martyred by Nero and Domitian. Nothing whatever answering to the crushing, destructive fall of the stone took place at the time. The development of the stone into a mountain does not begin <coughs> sorry. The development of the stone into a mountain does not begin till the image has been broken to pieces together and become like the chaff of the summer threshing floor. That was the sense I was looking for earlier. Mm -hmm. Now, the gradual growth of Christianity has been taking place while the image still stands and cannot, therefore, be the thing intended by this striking symbol. Besides this, the spiritual kingdom of God, now established in the hearts of men, is in no respect similar 
to the great universal earthly empires which form the four first of this series. That's a very important part of this book. The spiritual kingdom of God, now established in the hearts of men, is in no respect similar to the great universal earthly empires, because the spiritual is not like the carnal, right? It is yeah. the spiritual empire that we are living the in. The difference between spiritual Israel and this false Israeli state we have, yeah? Exactly, yeah. This nation state they put out there. Yeah, the on, nation uh, state, in, thank in you. The state of Palestine in 1948, yeah. Which was, by the way, first planned to be a two state solution, but the Palestinians have always been denied to become a state, even up to now. Mm -hmm. So, but again, that's, <clears throat> that's something for another day to study. But I think this sentence that I put in green here is, is very important for us to understand correctly. Besides this, the spiritual kingdom of God, now established in the hearts of men by the circumcision of the hearts, yeah, yeah. is in no respect similar to the great universal earthly empires which form the four first of this series. It is not of the world. It employs not the sort of conquest, no, because we take on the whole armor of God in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18. That is not a carnal sword, because we are in a spiritual battle. It does not embrace as its subjects all within a certain territory. It is invisible, spiritual. It is heavenly. The coming empire of the stone is a fifth analogous to the other four though of supernatural origin, wider extent, and endless duration. It is a universal empire of earth ruled directly by the God of heaven. And universal in this regard does not mean Catholic. Today, earthly empires care nothing for the God in heaven. Even in the British Parliament, which is as righteous and pure as any of earth on earth, the question of whether any fresh legislation is pleasing to God is never even thought of. God's name is never mentioned in the Parliament when discussing legislative measures. He is not considered at least as an open confession and our histories are now written without mentioning God. How much do you see a mirror of this happening in Great Britain and <laughs> the United States of America, Brett? Oh, Lord. Yeah, we definitely Darryl? followed. Jeez. The United States definitely followed in uh, Great Britain's footsteps. That's for sure. Yeah. They, well said. They write from the time of the yep the Oxford movement and that and that uh, Romanism never died in England and uh, Yerk has pointed this out and even though uh, King Henry the Eighth uh, he just took over the head of the headship of the Church the Roman Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. away from the Pope, but Romanism basically stayed there intact, and, uh, and then in Cardinal, uh, John Henry Cardinal Newman's time in the Oxford movement, and that many of the Anglicans went right back easily, quite easily, into the Roman Catholic Church. And, yeah, good, good points, guys. Isn't that amazing how, Lord, how the Lord just used, was it King Henry VIII? In his carnal desire for this woman, was it Anne Bolin? Yeah. And that's just amazing to actually utilize in their constitution. They tried to create a true, a somewhat true Protestantism, didn't they? And the church followed through. It well, didn't really work, but it did create a structure that opposed the false Christ. I think, Brett, it is sure to say that as long as the Puritans ruled in Great yeah, Britain, in that's England, right. as long as they ruled, um, it was still Protestant. But at the end of the 18th century, beginning of the 19th century, they gave that up. 
and that yeah. led into the Emancipation Act of 1829 yeah, that that's we spoke right. about earlier. That's right. And that's that, right. And that led to the rise of the um, Oxford movement, which had its uh, main movement between 1833 and 1845. Now, <laughs> think about this 12 year of time. 1833 to 1845 Oxford movement, 1933-1945 Third Reich in Germany. Do you think oh, that is a man. coincidence? Wow. <laughs> no, no, no. No way, no way. But, you know, when that Oxford movement hit, that brought all of a sudden authors like Henry Gretton Guinness, James Atkin Wiley to the top. And they wrote numerous books against the Roman papacy, and especially Henry Gretton Guinness, in his wonderful, wonderful work, Romanism and the Reformation, gives a warning, even he says so in the beginning of the book, he gives a warning to the Protestants of today, to the young generations of today, speaking of 1888, and you can of course transfer that into 2019, where we live in today, to warn them of the Roman deception that is all over over all over them. James Edgar Wiley did that with Rome and Civil Liberty. James Edgar Wiley wrote a three part volume of the history of Protestantism. He wrote so many interesting books, among others The Great Exodus, which we are still going to study in the future. But now for the moment we are kept here with the book from Albert Close. And we are Ah yes, you're kind of got a comment. Yeah, Got a comment. I just wanted is to say just, that we come to a close, but uh, yeah. Please. Yeah, we should, definitely. And I think we should maybe um, mention the fact that uh, this is very much the spirit that Yurk and I have felt about studying uh, this book, The Great Exodus, or The Time of the End, How Near Are We to It, is that that title that James Aiken Wiley used for that book is so fitting for the times we live in today, I think it's drawing some attention. And not just for the weak at heart, for and those also, like it's us. Also, it's also fitting, Brett, sorry to interrupt you here. It is yeah, also please. Very fitting for the time when he wrote this. He published yeah, that that's book in right. 1862. That is some 30 years after the Oxford movement took off. That is a warning to the people that with the rise of Catholicism again in England... It is now coming to the to the closing of time. It is now really coming to the great exodus, to the time of the end. This is the yes, last. So we, this hmm. is the last coming up of the power of the Romans again after they have been defeated by the Reformation, after they have been defeated by the Puritan government in England, after they have been defeated by the reign of Prince uh, of, of of Queen Elizabeth the first. Uh, of of um, uh, James uh, James the first of England the sixth of Scotland who gave us the King James Bible, and all the times in between when they had fights and fights against Charles uh, and uh, against the two Charles and then they had this glorious revolution in 1689, remember? Mm -hmm. And from that mm -hmm. time on, the Puritans ruled there until the Jesuits got their way and decapitated the thirteen colonies from. The, from Great England, uh, from 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 Old England, Great Britain. I wanted to say that Great England. Yeah. From from yeah. from Great Britain, and by that they had their little part where where they could play their politics out, and they did that ever since 1776 out from the United States of America, now ruling all the world on behest of the first beast of the Vatican, and um, they are going to be doomed too because. The Americans have not a Roman Catholic Church, but they have an American Catholic Church that is full of liberals, and Rome hates liberals and will persecute liberals as she did in the past, and she's going to do that again. And that Inquisition is coming up to your side over there in the world, United States of America, as it has been here already now some 80 years ago with the Third Reich of Germany that eradicated protestantism over here yeah that's really something you because this book the great exodus or the time of the end then transforms itself to us today as a historical record of what occurred in 1862 
and the struggles of this man, James Aiken Wiley, in his trying to reason with the scriptures. So we're looking at his account, although he does have flaws. Any of us would have the same flaws or worse or better. I don't know. Lord knows, but isn't it interesting? Sure is. I didn't keep the clock here. It's uh, oh, 56 minutes. Okay. So. Um, yeah, this might be a good time to close it down, huh? What do you guys think? Yeah. Yeah, we end it here in this uh, in this paragraph, right? Without mentioning God, yep. so that there's yep. no mentioning of God in the parliaments anymore. Yeah, I wanted I wanted to say to this little point, Brett, and uh, that's my closing remark. Then I give it up to Daryl and to you for the finishing words. Um, you guys have uh, on your dollar bill standing in God we trust. But except for that little mentioning of God, where is God to be found in the Constitution of the United States of America? Where is God to be found in the Bill of Rights in the United States of America? That is something that I always oh, but the problem ask you're... myself, you know? It, it's just, mm -hmm. no, listen, it's, it's mm -hmm. just the point. Please. Um, it's, uh, it's just a statement that is there. But you can print on paper everything you want. You know, it doesn't it it it, it, it doesn't have any power with it. Only right. It's all vain glory. It's yes, vain glory. It's vain glory. And these words are not empowered. In God we trust. Yeah. Okay. The German uh, 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 party that rules with Angela Merkel already since 2005 or six or so. Uh, calls itself the Christian Democratic Union, and we all understand, of course, that it is the Catholic Democratic Union. Mm -hmm. Germany is not Christian, it's not a Christian country anymore. It is a Christian country by name, maybe, but it is not a Christian country in the heart. Belgium is not a Christian country in the heart. Italy is not a Christian country in the heart. There is no Christian country in the heart all over the world, wherever I look. And that's why it is time that we are awaiting the stone not cut out with hands to come and smash the image of Daniel chapter 2 in the feet mixed with, iry, uh, with miry clay and bring it all to an end because there is no real true Christianity left here on this earth, except for a few people who still hold to the truth, mainly through reading the Bible, the 1611 authorized version of the Bible in English, and very, very few people still really do trust in God. As you can put on every dollar bill as much as you want, but it is just a shame that you put it on there. It has no meaning. But you have to put your trust in God through the Bible, reading your Bible, studying your Bible, living your Bible. Because the Bible mm -hmm. is the living word of God and it empowers you with life. Otherwise, you're yep. just dead. You want to be quick or you want to be dead? I want to read my Bible and I'll see you next time. Maranatha. I leave it up to Brett and Daryl. Yes, and... Uh, Probably Daryl first, right? Yeah, go ahead, Daryl, please. Well, I'm just uh, in 100% agreement with what Yurk has just said, and uh, again, as we pointed out on the previous, one of our previous YouTubers, I think the one's the one most recent, that that the Bible indeed is the operating manual for the human soul, and we need to to walk our way through the minefields of life, the Bible provides the light. And, then, and, we're, and when you read in the Psalms and that, you, the, your word is a, la a lamp, a light to my path. And uh, we don't, we're, we're living in a world of darkness, and we need that, the lamp, the light that comes from the Bible, the Holy Bible, and uh, I would just like to say one thing in passing, and, and that is I want to... We ask folks to get the book Antichrist Exposed. It's a two-volume book set. Antichrist Exposed, the Reformed and Puritan View of the Antichrist by Dr. Ronald Cook. He's, a, he's at least 80 years old, maybe a little older, having um, some medical problems. 
And uh, he and his wife, Sharon, are back there at Breckville Bible College. It's called, uh, the ministry is called Truth International Ministries. And I would urge everyone to get those two, two books because you're talking about over 700 pages uh, telling what uh, the Puritans, uh, the Reformers, what they all had to say about the Antichrist, and they all identified the Antichrist. He even gets into uh, what various early Christian groups also presented as their view on the Antichrist. And those books are available, and uh, the phone number is, and they're in uh, Max Meadows, Virginia, 276 637 3727. I'll give it a second time. 276 637 3727. And urge everyone to take advantage of uh, while they're there at uh, Max Meadows, Virginia, back from a, a, a vacation and that. And they do have spring break and the summer break and that for the college. So if you would like to get those books, now is a good time to get them. And that uh, gets uh, something that a man did a lot of research on, and that's Dr. Ronald N. Cook. He did a lot of research in putting together over 700 pages in that two-volume book set telling you the Reformed and Puritan view of the Antichrist. And uh, we all know who the Antichrist is, (laughs) and the Bible very clearly lays out who the Antichrist is in the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation, chapters 13 through 18, makes very clear, vividly describes uh, the qualifications for the office of the Antichrist. So again, good being on with uh, both of you gentlemen, and uh, uh, I'm going to get ready to go grab. I haven't had a real meal today, so I want to get something to eat. So God bless you, and uh, thanks uh, to both of you, uh, Yerk and uh, Brett, for your hard work and uh, that when you that you put into putting the be- uh, very aesthetic. We'll use a fancy word, uh, a very nice looking graphics, and that on these YouTubers or YouTube sessions recordings. So thank you, thank you, thank you, and uh, God bless you both. And I'm going to sign off. Yes, you're more, very welcome. Daryl, very, very welcome, and, and, and same to you, Yerk. I, I really appreciate all the work you've done, too, and Tom Fress of Inquisition Update as well yes. in bringing this dearly needed message to the world, really, and America and, and all of the, these, uh, these nations of the earth. They're all drunk, and... They're using the wine of Babylon, as we know the Bible is telling us, is trying to tell us. And, uh, you know, sometimes I'm just at a loss for words when you take it all in, you know, and you start to look at the bigger picture. And I think that this little book here is going to help all of us. So, it's in that spirit of truth and in the testimony of Jesus Christ that we find real prophecy And that's what it says in Revelation 19.10. And you can look that up and study Mm -hmm. the book yourself. And that's really where we find Christ. Because he leads us in his spirit alone with us into all truth. He is the comforter. He is the sacrifice that was made once for all eternity. And once we recognize that, it will transform us. Be ye not conformed but be rather transformed, as the Bible says, right? I can't remember the rest of that verse, but at least I got that far. (laughs) So, I can give it to you real quick. Please do. And I fell at his feet to worship him, and he said unto me, See, thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Thank you, Daryl. And that gets straight to the point that all of us, I think all three of us would perfectly agree on this. We are not doing this for our own benefit. We are doing this for you out there that are in the body of Christ and that are confused and hurt and 
looking for the truth and can't find it. And in that spirit, we close today. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lusts that war in your members? Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do ye think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep, that your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judgeth his brother speaketh evil of the law and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that judgest another? Go to now, ye that say today or tomorrow, we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. For as ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, If the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now ye rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire.